All right, it looks like we are at 602. So we want to get started, but first, before we begin, I want to say good evening to everyone. Um, I would like to first off start by saying thank you on behalf of the Hurston Wright Foundation, our executive director, Dr. Kadili, Khadija Ali Coleman, our events coordinator, Molly Rufus, and I, DeAndrea Johnson, the writing programs manager, for joining us for this reading on world building and Afrofuturism. In Hurston Wright's 30 year plus history, it has been our mission to provide services, supports, and opportunities that mentor, honor, and discover black writers. We offer professional development courses for our writers and summer workshops, annual awards, and an assortment of opportunities throughout the year for writers and for readers. This reading is part of Hurston Wright's 2023 Summer of Writing series. Please learn more about us by visiting hurstonwright.org. We will begin our reading with a video presentation with our host, Olu Butterfly, immediately following. Thank you. Vast tapestry of human imagination. There exists a realm where ancient traditions and futuristic visions intertwine. A place where the rhythms of the past dance with the pulsating beats of tomorrow. Welcome to the world of Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism, born from the depths of the African diaspora, weaves together the threads of history, culture, and speculative fiction to create a tapestry of boundless creativity. It emerges as an artistic and philosophical movement, challenging conventional narratives and propelling us towards a tomorrow where black voices soar. At its core, Afrofuturism envisions a future where the marginalized find liberation, where the forgotten stories are finally told. It embraces the cosmic, the futuristic, and the mystical, celebrating the interconnectedness of the past, present, and future. Today's readings feature the Afrofuturistic voices of playwright Nina Angela Mercer and speculative fiction writers Nisi Shaw and B. Sharice Moore. Today's reading is hosted by multidisciplinary artist and community organizer Olu Butterfly. Nisi Shaw is an African American writer whose science fiction works often reflect real world social cultural factors such as race, gender, and sexual orientation. Shaw's notable works include Everfair and Filter House, for which they won the James Tiptree Jr. Award. They are the co-author of Writing the Other, Bridging Cultural Differences for Successful Fiction. Their short stories have appeared in Asimov's Strange Horizons and numerous other magazines and anthologies. Nisi is teaching a virtual speculative fiction workshop this summer for Hurston Wright. B. Sharice Moore is one of the 2023 Hurston Wright Writers in Residence this year. She is a multi-genre author, curriculum designer, and poetry editor for FIRE magazine of Black Speculative Fiction. In 2020, she received the Sustainable Arts Foundation Award for YA Fiction, and her poem, Black Beat, was nominated for a 2022 Dwarf Star Award. In 2022, she edited Conjuring Worlds, an Afrofuturist textbook for middle and high school students. Her forthcoming books include Fangs, Feathers, and Folklore, a Field Guide of African Mythological Creatures, and Fatima's Fantastic City, a picture book that is to come out in 2025. B. Charisse has taught virtual writing and professional development courses with Hurston Wright since fall 2022. She is the lead workshop facilitator for our Read Black Books conference. During her residency, 
with the Hurston Wright Foundation from February to June 2023. B. Cherise Moore will be working on building a database of children's book and YA novels written by black authors that center the experiences of people of African descent. She will debut the database this summer during a workshop she will lead during Hurston Wright's inaugural Read Black Books Summer Symposium for Parents and Educators. Nina Angela Mercer's plays include Gutta Beautiful, Intigamegi, A Road and a Prayer, Gypsy and the Bully Door, and A Compulsion for Breathing. She is collab a collaborating writer and performer in Urban Bushwoman's Hans Blue. Her writing is published in Black Renaissance Noir, Continuum, the Journal of African Diaspora Drama, Theater and Performance, Performance Research Journal, A Gathering of the Tribes Journal, Black Girl Magic, Are You Entertained? Black Popular Culture in the 21st Century, Represent New Plays for Multicultural Youth, and So We Can Know. She is a summer workshop instructor for the 2023 Hurston Wright Writers Week workshop in playwriting. Our host is lyrical, visionary, and flying African, Olu Butterfly Woods. Olu is a social entrepreneur, mother of four, and a distinctive performance poet. She has received a Ruby's Artist Project Grant, a Maryland State Arts Council Individual Artist Award. She has been voted favorite all-around female poet at the People's Poetry Awards and best grassroots poet by the Baltimore City Paper. Born in Nigeria, raised in St. Croix, Virgin Islands in Maryland, she is the author of an acclaimed collection of poetry titled The Revenge of Dandelions. She will soon release Jupiter Memoirs, a collection of Afro-fantasy poems. A bold and activating curator, Olu has produced a popular artist development series called Organic Soul Tuesdays, a major Afro-future artscape anchor project, and the B-Stage at Apfram. Olu Butterfly was featured in the Netflix special Dark City Beneath the Beat, cast in the record-breaking world premiere musical Marley at Baltimore Center Stage, and has toured internationally with the band Fertile Ground as a principal dancer with the Sankofa Dance Theater and independently sharing the stage with legendary artists such as Hugh Masakela, The Last Poets, Mos Def, and Erica Badu. Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for spending your Friday evening with us, and we're going to make it 100% worth it. Um, I'm going to start off today, and I'm so excited to be in this company that I'm in right now. So I'm going to share some deep thoughts about being over everybody's head by Crystal Magna Ferrari. Afrofuturists. I don't like labels, but it is simpler than infinitely creative philosopher, psychologist, ballet dancer, astrologer, astronaut, lobbyist for disorganized tree huggers, out here smoking experience, sprinkling pixie dust like spliff ashes. Don't mind me. Don't pay attention to me. Real talk from expedited strawberry shaped lips with broken Sankofa hearts. I have a master's degree in soul but my slave name is Crystal Magna Ferrari. And I just wanna tell you that life ain't as precious as they made it out to be. And your outrage don't buy as much as you think it does. Listen, angels are ugly. And the mark of the beast is an unfortunately useful act with a five-star rating. Five stars is terrible when there are thousands whose light should be visible, but they've been censored English is my second language. My first is that's that shit. Cause you know, you like a girl with guacamole on her dashboard, a tambourine and her pocketbook. Take a sweet time to get it right in the express lane. That's me right now. Who grew up with Obatala instead of Jesus, taking Dogon notes, girl and a half on overtime with old black men she never got to meet parading in her heart. After all the petals fall off, I return the roses to the market. 
I ride the bus VIP that says not in service. I make wishes on open umbrellas inside buildings and breaking mirrors. You think I am strange for taking a vacation from the blues, from a peace brought to you by murderers. I am not a saint, but I am sane. I've been having me a heaven. I just wanted to be born in a pretty manger and not spend my best years behind bars. We all want the same thing. To have lots of real friends and basically be effortlessly discovered and given a contract for a million dollars to eat candy and not get cavities. You think I am crazy, but who wouldn't prefer spaceships to slave ships? I ain't wildin', just jealous, cause nobody asks birds for their passport. Gravity is a past lover pulling me down. I want to go to the country that monsters do not own. I want to be accused of stealing moments from the colonial facts of life, then escape on a getaway photon so the sun is only eight minutes away. I am a stay in orbit mom, drinking nectar and wiping butts with other solar powered females, taking a bow when they ain't even clapping. I'm the opposite of scorched earth policy. I am one of them minimum wage astronauts, hustling all day passes, working overtime, watching the sunrise. You can't sell people and can only pretend to own land. My rent costs 1,600 loose ones. So I want to be a part-time star saleswoman in a mean unicorn riding uniform. Name a constellation for my grandfather and discover my ancestors' original name for Mars. My name is Olu Butterfly. How y'all feeling today? Hey, everybody. All right. So I haven't um, figured out. I, my third eye is fine, but these ones right here. Um, you know, the pandemic, I blame everything when the pandemic stole some of that. So um, I'm very excited to introduce our first uh our first reader today, um, who's going to share with us, which is the incomparable, the incomparable Nina. <laughs> thank you, Olu. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Hurston Wright Foundation for inviting me into community. I'm reading from Gutter Beautiful, scene one. Anytime and all time, the crossroads. There is also a screen upon which various visual images can be shown throughout the play. Sound, thunder and lightning as a recording of Afro-Cuban drum master Alejandro Burillo plays. Screen images of our solar system. Papa G stands at the street corner under a spotlight. He is nodding off with his hat over his eyes. A timepiece hangs from his waist. He holds a staff. Papa G nearly falls onto the ground as he wakes from his sleep. Papa G checks his watch and begins laughing and talking to the God in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Mama Say is a short distance away, giving birth. Yes, it's time. I hear you. Yes, it's time. Papa G draws the four corners on the ground with a piece of chalk. Sound. Mama Say's blood curdling scream. A spotlight on Lola, dressed in white who sits above the stage on the riser watching the birth of her infant self. She packs her bags with pots, pans, dresses, baby dolls, white parasol, a baseball bat, and a small mirror. Mama Say moans with each push. Papa G paces around Mama Say while waiting for her labor to progress. Well, uh, make a kind of smart mouth, think she know everything. Give her a big old innocent eyes to trick a cat, but an even bigger heart to fall for a more smooth trick. On the third day of the last quarter of the new moon cycle in the month of her birth, upon turning 17, she will sell her soul to me so she can <laughs> feel good. <laughs> feel better. She will give back to me what I am giving to her now. Power. Ah, a funky strut. Ah, that little bit of something she getting from her mama. And I will test the worth of the so-called <laughs> Black woman. Would you shut the hell up? 
Do I get all in your business when you do what you do? Besides, I don't know if I can do this again, Papa. You are gonna have to do it again, Mama. This one sure is coming and you sure are here and I'm going to help make the crossing over work. Now push and stop complaining. You might have to bring this heifer into the world, but I got to make up a world of tricks to break her down and she's a wild one. So push you mother of a black would be queen. Push. Stop rushing me, fool. It takes focus. And I got to do this. I got to do this knowing she going to do more than bleed. She got to suffer. But I got to do this. Time is running short. Soon my own voice won't even be a whisper no more. I doubt that with your big mouth. Lips could stop an ocean. Now come on, push. I can almost see the head coming. <laughs> Not as big as mine, but you know. You think this one will figure it out though, Papa? Don't matter. We got nothing but time, right? If she dies trying and she dies, she ain't gonna do nothing but come back. That's why I don't get all emotional when I bring one of them over. It ain't worth it. This is life. This is what we do. And if she falls for my tricks, then the love will burn stronger. And hey, maybe this one will actually prove your theory now, push. These young ones ain't so smart these days, Papa. I'm about tired of ah, watching this. Oh, playing with these mm, little black girls. Oh, I, I worked hard to bring them over here and they just so damn blind. I, oh, woman, as much talking as you do, seems like she should be coming through your mouth instead of that cavernous hole you got down there. Besides, my job ain't so easy either. I mean, I gotta be at every corner of the universe every second of the day and night, no matter what time zone now. Come on, woman, we got work to do. Oh, Lord have mercy. Yes, mercy. All must come through me. Yes, come through me. Papa will make it better or worse. One more time, Mama. I got the bag waiting for her right here. Lola exits with her bags. Ow! The little bitch bit me. Got teeth all ready. Sound. Baby's first cries. Scream. A shooting star blazes. Earth comes into foreground. Okay, one more time for that. Oh, I got one more for you. Oh, okay. Yes, Kalunga Ma. Now, Kalunga Ma is a monologue that was developed um, for Haint Blue, a dance theater work by Urban Bushwoman, um, which I collaborated on as a writer and performer uh, for from 2020 to 2023, Kalunga Ma. First, there was an emptiness, a world without visible life, a line with an empty circle in the middle. But just cause wasn't no visible life don't mean wasn't nothing there, just couldn't tell yet and wasn't nobody there to see it no way. But where there is an emptiness, unknown forces gonna start something, make a commotion, become force, become waves. Call me Kalunga, myself a blaze, a fire floating and exploding the emptiness, becoming the source of life on earth and other places unknown to the frequencies of your understanding. Overstand, Kalunga, complete unto myself. I said I fired up the Mbungi, set it off and ran it down. The voodoo that is, and it said, nah, it shouted, the roof, the roof. The roof is on fire. 
We don't need no water. Let that motherfucker burn. Burn, motherfucker, burn. I say I blew it up and I blew it down. A storm vital as the principle of change. A too hot thing till it got cool. Real cool till it got solid and earth got born. Sun, moon, stars, ntango, ngonda, mbuetete, all hanging out in that upper space, that upper room, and it was lit. Floating inside Kalunga, God and change, force in motion, just moving along the path, going around and around and around on this green and breathing planet, this life-giving and sustaining roundness, this lush and decadent place y'all been so blessed to know as home. You see, the earth rotates around the sun and human life becomes many of them rising and setting starshine, being and becoming new fire, forever returning inevitably to the water's depths. But did y'all know you is also the medicine? You is also the root. You hold potential of multitudes because you is a specialist, baby, if you study. A true knower because it is in you, just as sure as that first nothingness birthed vital life into worlds. You is a whole system within a system, a living and radiant light growing into the ways of making one's own history, a path mapping a way that extends into the beyond. So wear your red in it, be that fire. Woo woo, throw something in the chat for Nina. Woo woo, that's right. So if you have just joined us, welcome. First of all, absolutely. Um, we want to shout out all, all these wonderful people in the audience from all over uh, the United States, the world, and perhaps different um, galaxies. We really appreciate your presence. And um, I like to say, you know, behind everything, there's a secret Black woman making it happen. But right now, we're not a secret. We're in the front forefront making it happen. And I would like to um, remind you that if you have questions, first of all, please do have some questions. We're going to um, save those for the end. Um, we are going to go to our next amazing wordsmith. Please give it up for this author, B. Sharice Moore. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to read from my novel, um, Dr. Marvelous Jen's Odd Scholars. Dr. Marvelous Jen's Odd Scholars is um, it's it's a book about four young people who win the opportunity to tour a uh, an amusement park in 1920, um, and the amusement park is called the Motherland, and it was sponsored by Marcus Garvey, and it is a an amusement park that is fashioned after uh, the continent of Africa. So. Um, this chapter is called The Haunted Oblique, The Haunted Oblique. A rocky path stretched ahead once they reached the surface. The moon hung high in the sky and a glass needle rose high above their heads like a weapon threatening the midnight sky. The Haunted Oblique, Omen read aloud, a cursive script scrawled above the entrance. There are two kinds of time thieves, Claire began. Keepers and gatherers. Ghoul gatherers collect the souls trapped in limbo. Then the keepers store them in jars on the shelf of the damned until they're used for fuel. Elliot examined the base of the obelisk to its tip, a pyramid shimmering red, black, and green. How much you want to bet some of those souls were let loose inside? Wouldn't shock me. Any park that's home to a group slang and a sphinx wouldn't see nothing wrong with a few hints. Paints floating around to scare the hell out of folks. Claire took a deep breath. Remember, the damned can't hurt the living. She waved them inside. Keep that in mind and you'll be okay. Brenda removed the goggles from her eyes and filed inside. 
The heavy glass door shut behind them with an echoing thud. Inside, the obelisk felt like a museum, stiff and expansive. A long red carpet spread to the opposite wall. Marble statues loomed above like wardens, keeping watch over prisoners on either side. She felt claustrophobic. Thankfully, the glass panes allowed for plenty of light from the stars and moon outside. A glass elevator awaited them. She glanced at Omen. His once confident and steady posture now looked slumped and unsure. As he walked, she caught a glimpse of his neckline. The chain was no longer there. Her heart dropped. The expression he wore was something between sadness and loss. She connected the dots. The mad dash from the cave, the silence inside the carts. She couldn't help but feel responsible. This had all been her idea, her plan. Well, let us pray. Claire took a deep breath and stepped inside the elevator. Brenda followed, her gaze stuck to a panel of buttons. Some blinked, vibrated, and buzzed. Others looked like they'd been filled with liquid mercury, blocks of ice, or colorful coral from the depths of the sea. The elevator's been covered in protective spells. Hang on tight, Claire said and grabbed hold of a bronze railing. She reached around Elliot and pushed one of the buttons. Brenda gripped the bar in the neck of time. Nick of time. The elevator rose with lightning speed. Before she knew what hit her, they came to a sudden halt. She looked around at the terrified faces as they hovered like an open umbrella caught in a storm. Anxious, she searched for Elliot's eyes. Before she could find them, a disfigured hand crawled across one of the glass walls. Humans, half dissolved with limp limbs, scratched at the elevator as it drifted along. Her breath hitched inside her throat as a ghoulish figure stared through black sockets, daring her to look before darting in a different direction. They're in different stages of decay. Claire placed a palm on the glass. My guess is they've been captured from different centuries. Some were murderers during the Crusades of Europe. Others took part in the Middle Passage. Others were conquistadors and colonizers. How can you tell? Elliot asked in a hush. He held his breath as the shadows covered the elevator in clumps, like blood clotting a wound. Sages know souls. You can feel them. She pointed toward a deformed figure climbing on the ceiling. He was one of the men who fought Queen Nanny at the Maroons. He was found recently. Feels fresh. She turned to another wall where a woman reduced to a head and torso crawled along the glass. This one was a slaver during the Indian Ocean slave trade. Brenda took a step back. The Indian Ocean slave trade? Never heard of it. Claire stared into the abyss. Many haven't. But between 1500 and 1900, the Arabs enslaved East Africans, shipped them from along the Indian Ocean's coast to North Africa and other parts of the world. These are slavers from Algeria and Libya in 1520. She chuckled darkly and pointed at a few souls whipping around the cube in a feeding frenzy. The grotesque bodies slammed into the glass only to slide off and dissolve into smoke before reforming again. Not all of them are from the, from the past. Some are from now and others the distant future. She closed her eyes and placed an ear to the glass. Some organized lynch mobs. Some took part in the assassinations of our leaders. Her voice cracked. Of course, they never stood trial. But here, this is where they received justice. They exist in a limbo of sickness and disease. We are the flesh they'll never feast upon. They live half lives forever. Brenda watched the spirits hover in sluggish agony. She could feel the bowel coat the back of her throat as one of the ghouls struggled to force its heart inside a rotting chest cavity. The dead muscle hardened first into a tangled fist of dry veins and then crumbled to a pile of ash. The act was a broken record, skipping a sixth song of rep repetitive gore. It's like they're our exhibits, she chewed on her lip. Our revenge. This ride, this obelisk, is our revenge. Claire shoved an index finger in the direction of a soul that looked more like a man than the others. Sometimes the souls are collected days after death and burial. This one's been cursed by an echo spell. Echo spells continue on until infinity. Brenda and Elliot huddled together and watched as a baby with pasty flesh crawled forward matured from infant to toddler to man, then pulled at its throat until strips of smoke melted into the darkness like flakes of ember, only to begin the cycle again. Sweet justice, Elliot muttered under his breath. Brenda laid a hand on his shoulder as he stood there, 
still as a stone, eyes trained on the speckle in front of them. Justice, she whispered. For what felt like a long time, they looked on as death crawled all around them. Every now and then a moan would reverberate through the space, causing a feeding frenzy as the dead feasted on one another. Then came the silence, like a long and drawn out death she hoped to never know. Yes, B. Charisse. Thank you for all the things you had to do to make it here with us today. <laughs> I haven't seen you in person. Wait a minute, this doesn't count as in person in a minute. Um, uh, so is, am I interrupting something? You have another piece to share or? Um, no, no. Um, has everybody already done two pieces? Yes, it's not round robin style. This is all oh. you want. Okay, okay. So I can just continue on. I was, uh, yeah. I'm but... really never late like this. I'm so sorry. It's, you is, are here. You want to all breathe? And we have not all shared. Okay, okay, got it. I have something else that I can just actually continue on from there, and that makes sense. And then we, um, and then I will let uh, Nisi share. All right, uh, where am I? Just close the book. <laughs> I'm so glad you're not going to just leave us there. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm not. I'm not. Oh gosh. All right, here we are. All right. Um, instead of looking into the eyes of the undead, Claire willed herself to concentrate on warm memories. Thoughts of Big Mama and the good times came flying back, the laughter, the church songs, the food. She breathed in deep, hoping the nostalgia would lift the heavy cloak of death shrouding them on all sides. We're almost at the top, Elliot pointed toward the elevator ceiling. The figures shrank beneath them and the darkness opened to a night sky peppered with stars. In the distance, the moonlight bathed the grand menagerie in a fuzzy white glow. Claire watched as the elevator slid to a stop. A steel track protruded from the oblique pyramidal top, dipped out of sight, looped over the churning river below and disappeared inside the mouth of the cave. Then the waterfall slid into view. From this angle, the soul shelf glimmered like a gift. They were hundreds of feet above solid ground and with nothing below except a host of damned souls floating in oblivion, fear made her shiver again. That might have been the scariest stuff I've ever seen in my life, she muttered. Omen gave her a sidelong glance. Be thankful you didn't have to barter with a group slang. There was a coolness in his reply. It felt foreign. He'd been warm since they'd met. What would cause such a shift and then it hit her? She turned and searched for the tooth dangling from the silver chain around his neck. Nothing. Its absence was a blow. This wasn't just a chain. It was a legacy, a piece of him. Omen, I... I knew the risks, he said, waving her off. I knew that chain meant a lot to your family and to you, she pressed. Ain't no use crying over spilled milk, he said, avoiding her eyes. I'm sorry, she whispered. The apology felt empty as it left her lips but there was nothing else she could say to comfort him. No other words mattered. She felt tongue-tied as he stalked to the elevator's other side. The doors opened to reveal a dimly lit room. Numbers and equations glowed on the walls. Beakers filled with colorful liquid boiled, smoked, and whistled in concert over ice blue flames. Steel instruments hummed and whizzed. Numerous soul jars zipped along a conveyor belt wrapped around the room's perimeter like an eerie assembly line. This is where the souls are synthesized to fuel time travel. Claire walked toward the belt and bent low to expect one of the jars. Meanwhile, Elliot reached in his pockets and held the vial of Jingu tears up to a ray of moonlight, knifing through a window. Sparks fizzed and popped on the lip of a beaker as he combined his tonic with the final ingredient, secured it with a cork, and stuffed it inside his satchel. On the other side of the room, open, Omen opened his knapsack and spread the stones on an empty table covered with ridges, ridges and symbols. This is the timetable. Claire ran an open palm over the polished wood. It's where all time-related instruments are assembled. Back watches, minute rings, air dials, second swatches. Brenda cut in. How'd you know that? Claire whirled around to face her. Brenda shrugged. Couldn't sleep. So I studied. Stop. 
All right, one more game. Be Sharice Moore. Thank you. And you have the opportunity uh, with all of the authors that you're hearing from today to actually work with them. They're all leading workshops with the Hurston Wright Foundation. And that is also true of our final author. And um, I want to make sure that um, you all know that you will be welcome after this to ask some questions and give some comments. And if y'all don't have questions, I'm gonna ask some questions, but um, I like it. I like to keep it communal. So uh, please, pretty please, do uh, give us a little something, something, uh, Miss Nisi. Okay, so um, the theme is Afrofuturism. And uh, what I'm actually doing is, okay, time is a lie, right? It, it's cyclical, you know? So I'm going back to the past. I'm going to read an excerpt from a story that was reprinted in my collection, Our Fruiting Bodies but it first appeared in an anthology called Swordstone Table, a book of stories by authors trying to subvert the mythology surrounding King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So I'm blackifying that. Uh, I chose to re-envision the relationship between King Arthur's magician Merlin and the sorceress Nimue. In my version, Nimue is a wandering albino magician from the Lake Victoria region of Central Africa. This excerpt takes place after Nimue has come to Merlin's retreat to study with him. Uh, the only other thing you need to know is uh, Nimue has a cat named Ode. Uh, when I first began to read publicly, I made a vow to always sing as part of my performance. For this piece, I'll sing a verse of a song by the poet Yeats, Sally Gardens, because the title of my story is I Being Young and Foolish, and that's one of the song's phrases. Down by the Sally Gardens, my love and I did meet. She passed the Sally Gardens, with little snow white feet. She bid me take love easy as the leaves grow on the tree. But I being young and foolish with her would not agree. She went to her bed of heather alone that first night and got up from it the same way. Ode roused her when it was early morning. Outside the hut's walls, the still sunken sun's light whispered the air awake. A moment's wait in the clearing and the trail down to the hazels formed itself out of the thinning shadows. She and Ode followed the trail and under the queen tree's branches, she sought the tree's roots with softly thrusting fingers, excavated the finest of their tendrillings and ate them. She knew from previous meals that these northern webs became less active as the year's cold came on. Nonetheless, it was Nia's practice to consume them as soon as she could, consume some sample of the fungal lace linking together the flora of whichever woods she lived in. A lingering red start called her deeper into the forest to where the oak ruled the hillsides. Like her, surely this little bird was a far traveler. Unlike her, it had returned to where it began, though soon it would leave again. She'd met a red start once on the shores of Lake Naluyubayali. Red starts did not love the North's cold winters. Remain here, she instructed Ode. They didn't, but neither did they accompany her as she sought for the singing, slipping off instead on a mission of their own so she was able to approach the bird alone. Singing serenely despite her presence, the red start balanced on a high, near leafless sprig jutting up from a young attendant tree. Nia coaxed him to her hand. Tell my auntie I am well, she crooned. Find her where the shorebirds flock, casting her net for my uncle's boat, 
or resting in the shade of the Iroko trees, which our ancestors seeded there, the place we call Naka Songola. You will know you've reached my aunt because she shines like me. Nia released the bird. He perched a moment more on her thumb and flew off southward. Higher up and higher in, she found the queen of these oaks and again ate from among the roots. The taste was fine, but the hazels would be better for her burying. Circling wide, she came last to the silver trunks of the beech trees, performed the same actions, and came to the same conclusion. The hazels would be her burying place. As Nia returned to the hut, mist closed around her like a memory. Out of the enveloping whiteness, Odea appeared, joining her as if they'd never left her side. The trail weakened. Nia relied on her burgeoning sense of the countryside to guide her back to the hut. Merlin greeted her at its door. You touch the land, he pronounced. The land touches me, breathes me, drinks me, draws me in, lets me out, she thought. All the land and air and ocean she'd passed between here and Lake Naliubayali did so now. The strength of her magic depended on this intermingling. Her magic strength and growth, she wandered in its service. Come. The magician fed her a cup of dried and toasted grains mixed with hazelnuts and goat's milk. They must have been procured from an off-island farm because she'd seen signs of none nearby this morning. With his food, Merlin brought forth the question she'd been expecting since they met. Aren't the people of Ethiop black of visage? Most of us, she answered. Like devil, she'd heard her race describe but I've been as you see me from my birth. What of your parents? Ode turned away from the pinch of grains Nia offered them, uninterested. Both my parents are dead. I never knew them. I'm sorry. I never knew them, she repeated. My aunt and uncles who cared for me tell me my mother and father were quite normal in how they looked. She licked off the grains Ode had spurned and reached for the napkin to wipe her hand. The magician held the napkin. She tried to tug it away. He kept his hold tight, his gaze on her hand, on her skin. Those in your village thought you a witch because you were not as they are. Indeed, they had. But rather than respond to uh, answer what was had been stated, not asked, Nia reached with her other hand to lift that tucked chin and raise Merlin's eyes to meet her own. He stared without blinking. A seeing was upon him. For five long beats of her blood, Nia cradled the magician's jaw in her steady left palm. Then he jerked and drew back. He staggered to his feet, kicking a table leg. Bowls skittered to the table's edge. What had frightened him so? Something seen? Her experience with other tutors had taught Nia not to pry early on in a relationship. She would wait for whatever explanation was offered. I'm sorry, said the magician again. And that was all she got from him for the moment. The quarter passed, seven days. A pattern emerged. While the sun hung above the horizon, she went about fishing, foraging for berries, nuts, mushrooms, and other provender. And harvesting herbs it would be helpful to have over the winter. As evening dimmed and sank the sun, Merlin called her to, to him to teach her. He taught her in the ephemeral room above the ground floor of the hut, or in a cave opening in the slope behind it. He showed her trays crawling with people as small and purposeful as ants, opened books filled with images which moved while she watched them, then returned to their starting places when she looked away. He blinked slow as Oda in approval of her ability to sit motionless as a heron through a lesson on creating new homes for the future to live in. That brought a troubling bout of smugness. Stillness was the first skill that the trees had taught Nia. Tools for digging rested behind the, the hunt on the, uh, the side opposite its interest entrance, sorry. On the seventh day, after gathering a pan of rose hips off a wild hedge the oak trees showed her, 
Nia began her grave. She left the full pan of rose hips on the table for Merlin to prepare as he would, shouldered shovel and pick, and went to work. The hazel's roots parted easily for her. By midday, the hole was deep enough. She set about widening it. Oda watched her from atop the little hill of dirt she'd cast up. They only watched. Their part would come soon, tonight. She finished well ahead of time, even allowing herself a trip to the brook to bathe before returning to the hut to eat. The evening study session commenced as usual, though in a new venue, a blooming bower, a summerish arch of flowers with two seats of living wood. The method of the bower's conjuration was Merlin's chosen topic, and he ignored her attempts to lure him onto other topics until the lesson ended. For a moment, both of them sat in darkening silence. The magician plucked a spray of sweet-scented bryony and plated it with another of honeysuckle. You'll wear these tonight during your burial. He knew. Who told you? We have a similar ritual in these lands, but only for men in the spring. That was as near to an answer as the magician ever gave. He twisted the ends of his plate together to form a wreath and presented to her. Here, shall I accompany you? Or is this working solitary? Stop there. One more again for Nisi Shaw. Woo I want to publicly apologize for, um, I called you my neighbor. I have a neighbor across the hall named Miss Nisi, <laughs> who's also a wonderful human being, but that's not what I meant to do. So thank you so much. Uh, we have experienced such an array of uh, just words that have taken me all over the place, touching on topics of mothering, justice, uh, nature and ritual. Please, please do um, uh, ask some questions. I have some while y'all are thinking of yours and um, we're, we're loving all the comments. Please keep them coming. So one question was directly to Nisi Shaw about um, when, um, what made you decide to include singing in your performance? That's from the chat. Oh, so I did a reading in... Uh... Moscow, I, Moscow, Idaho. What? Yeah. <laughs> Why? But never mind. But I did it there and uh, I did it with someone else and uh, we sang beforehand and I noticed that people really perked up. They really liked it. So I was like, well, then, you know, let's let's give this a little more life. And sometimes I'll sing songs that I ask people to join in and that really gets the audience going you know, get some audience participation, break down that fourth wall. Thank you. Now I have a question for everybody, which is um, also from the chat. We've just heard a retelling of Earth's origins, which I'm also working on. Renegotiated justice and a networking of existing stories to me, Afrofuturism or black cultural work as a whole is embedded in a Sankofa ideology of reaching back while creating something new. How do you interpret an Afrofuturist setting? How do you bring the Afrofuture or Black people in the future into your settings? Um, anybody can start, or if you need me to repeat any part of that. I would love to um, respond because it, it's bringing me to my initial response um, when Khadija included me for this particular reading was, well, I'm all about Sun Ra. I've been all up in his archive and at the Schomburg. I love Octavia Butler. I love Nnedi Okafor. I love writers across genre, but I've never considered myself an Afrofuturist writer. I've never used that language to define myself. But the way that I understand Afrofuturism, I belong there because Black folk are always in the future. We are always ahead. We are always cultivating, innovating, making something out of nothing, you know, fitting a square into a circle. We're always finding 
the thread to continue us into the future. You know, um, I understand Afrofuturism as being an affirmation of our lives and the inevitability that we will continue forward, that we've been in the past, in the future, in the present, all at the same time in a spiral all along. Um, you know, like I love what Nisi said at the beginning of our talk, you know, when she said time is an illusion, you know, I mean, we, we can speculate about what may come, but we also know, at least I know I dream, I'm a lucid dreamer, I've been a lucid dreamer all my life, I remember dreams from my childhood, and so I wake pretty much every morning with memory of having traveled somewhere before. And so what I've come to understand is that we exist simultaneously at different planes of reality in different places. And so that's, that's what I understand. And it also informs, I think, my writing. Um, I write a lot of work where there is no veil between the living and the dead, you know, which to me is also a part of this visioning of an Afrofuturism, that we are not solely here amongst human beings, that the non-human, that the spirits are always with us. Um, again, like that the trees can teach us lessons. To me, that's what Afrofuturism is. To be so forward thinking that you can get beyond the idea that we as human beings are the only sentient life forms here that have knowledge and wisdom to share. So. Thank you. Does anybody else want to touch that question? I just want to say that um, uh, Walida Imarisha, uh, another visionary Black woman writer, uh, says that we are the Afro future because we are our ancestors' science fiction. We, we, you know, in their wildest dreams, we exist. Our ancestors dreamed us, and here we are. So we are the Afro future. So whatever we do is the Afro future. <laughs> um, I definitely agree with um, both Nina and with Nisi uh, about Afrofuturism and just our mere existence and our desire to push forward um, makes us futurists. Um, there's two things that I've done the first thing is the uh, Conjuring Rose textbook. So uh, the Conjuring Rose textbook um, is a first of its kind, huge uh, textbook full of short stories, poetry, artwork, and nonfiction articles that are related to Afrofuturism. And it is specifically for middle and high school students. And I think sometimes we don't do enough to cultivate young writers. And so what I did was I spearheaded a project where students would be exposed to Afrofuturism, be exposed to, um, to works um, uh, by uh, Black writers uh, throughout the diaspora as well as on the continent. And I think um, some of the work doesn't necessarily have to be metaphorical. Some of it needs to be literal. Like we need to produce things that can go in classrooms that are accessible for homeschoolers, for um, private schools and, and any educators that are, are open to sharing these stories with their students because they're not going to get them in the mainstream curriculum. But if we're writing them and if we're creating activities and curricula to go along with them, then that's continuing um, the Afrofuturist vision from Sun Ra. And, and those, of course, that, that came before us, and of course, uh, Octavia Butler, et cetera. Um, another thing that I've done is my, my current book, uh, my current novel, is on submission, so let's pray that somebody will like it enough to pick it up. But um, it's, it's about the future of food, you know? And, and that's something that I come from a family that love food, they love to cook, and so I wrote up, yes, son. Thank you. 
My son just interrupted me to tell me I was amazing. That's sweet. <laughs> but anyway. <That's> okay. <laughs> so um, it's about the future of food and it's about a little girl whose family owns a magical food factory. And this magical food factory has been passed down for more than a hundred years from her great grandfather in New Jersey, great great grandfather, excuse me, in New Jersey. And um, it's this few, they use these futuristic and magical means to prepare food, and specifically desserts, cakes, pies, ice cream. So um, that's how I bring Afrofuturism into my work um, and into my settings. I'm always thinking about the future, and I'm always thinking about. Um, how we can incorporate that into uh, into how we think about you know tomorrow and 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 our, and our communities. Thank you for that. So um, I have a couple more questions, but I see that I'm trying to be graceful about the time. So I'm going to take my cues from Hurston Wright about if we have time for the couple more questions because I definitely want to make sure we get in how we can stay connected to these authors before we um, log off to do all our various other Friday evening activities. I'm going to stay in the house. It's going to be so great. <laughs> so um, I don't know if I have any, uh, feel free to come off to, to give me some instructions. Otherwise, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Oh, we have time for one more. We can do another question. Okay. So one question is specifically for Nisi, and then um, the other is for everybody. So, um, Nisi, what does blackifying? Wait a minute, let me let me look at the exact question. Um, what does uh, blackifying uh, look like to you, or mean to you? So, um, when I say that, uh, semi facetious, but what I mean is um, there have to be people of color present at every moment of, of history. So one of the things that I've been hearing is that the King Arthur, the, tab the round night, uh, round table, the knights, all that is, is like, you know, like the heart of whiteness. And I'm just like, well, why, why can't we be there too? Why can't we have all of it? You know, it's not just like that there are black mermaids, it's that there were black people going all around the world, you know, centuries ago. So uh, that's what I meant by by blackifying uh, in that particular case. And I've done it a few other pl places too. Sometimes it has to do with putting black people in the middle, you know, rather than totally leaving them out. So that's what I meant. Oh, you're you're muted, Olu. Mm. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. So uh, this final question is like two parts, and then we're going to be done. <laughs> so, um, why in the world did you pick this genre? Would be the one question. Um, you know, uh, where there wasn't. You all are still pioneering. You know, we do have some wonderful um, people who have. Um, done a lot of of things in this particular genre but afro fantasy afro uh futurist writing science fiction why this and then um the second part is um as we hope that our um that our concepts spread there is this sense of um co-opting sometimes that comes with uh the spreading of um, concept. So um, the future of, of Afrofuturism, how do we uh, keep it, I guess? Um, mm -hmm. So that's my two part is one has to do with the past. Why did you choose this? And um, how can we, uh, I guess, keep our, keep us ours? Somebody besides me. <laughs> Really? Okay. <laughs> Fine. Oh, so um, I chose this genre because it was full of possibility because it was not socked into um, the version of the truth that we are all supposed to buy being part of this 
uh, consumer and uh, patriarchal and uh, capitalist and and uh, European hierarchy that we're we're stuck in right now. So um, I wanted to get get involved in a genre that had more possibilities, right? Uh, and as far as what's going to happen with the next girl, I don't know. I mean, everything, you know. And and as far as what I'm going to do to try and and make it uh, stay viable is uh, I'm going to support the work of all my fellow writers and make us a voice that cannot be silenced because we are there, we're so many and we're so loud. So, so now somebody else has to talk, really. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'll go. I, I write what I feel. I write what, what rings as true and urgent to me. And I don't know that I have chosen um, a genre, like one genre solely. I mean, I'm a multidisciplinary artist. Um, I came here today to read plays because that's that's what I agreed to do, and I'm teaching a playwriting workshop. But I, in general, whatever I write or whatever I create is what is most urgent and most true and necessary. And so I determine the genre, the form, the approach based on how I receive it you know, how spirit brings it to me. And I imagine that, you know, you can call me an Afrofuturist, you can call me a ritual theater practitioner. You know, there are many things that you can call me. I will continue to make work for as long as I am able because it's my purpose, it's why I'm here. Um, and, you know, I don't worry about people appropriating or taking a culture from us because they cannot take it from us. We simply exude, you know, the beauty of who we are and the lineage that we bring with us. And we just continue to create. And the resonance of what was before will be carried with us into the next iteration of what we will create. No one can take from us what is always with us and internally like true to who we are. You know, like I don't, I never worry about anything like that. Look at how we we come up with the next thing. We 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 do it a little different and we want to share it with people too. You know, like how how do we create change? How do we inspire, catalyze people to relate to one another differently if we don't open our work up for people to enjoy it? Thank you for that, for the words and the hands. I was I was there with you. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> so um be sure you have any comments on that, and then we're gonna. Sure. So to make sure we can stay connected. Sure. Um, just as a final thought, um, why did I choose this? Yeah, um, like me now, I'm a multi-genre writer. So, um, and I am starting to see Afrofuturism simply as hope, you know, hope for the future. And so even though like my in my forthcoming picture book, it's a social justice picture book about blight and poverty in Baltimore City, but it's about hope. So in some ways, how was that not futurist, you know? Um, so um, yeah, so I don't think I necessarily chose just this one particular genre or subgenre, but um, I, I just, I love to write and I love to explore possibilities as Nisi said. So um, Afrofuturism is here. Um, as far as us, <laughs> making sure that our stuff remains our stuff. You know, it reminds me of Intazaki Shang. Somebody walked away with all our stuff, right? <laughs> um, I think, you know what we need to do? I think the key is not to just stop with the writing. So many of us are teachers, right? And I think that there is value in developing curriculum, um, 
discussion questions, workbooks around um, the things that we create. Um, because those are the kinds of things that have real sticking power where, okay, you created this amazing book. Like, um, I cannot wait to read uh, uh, Nisi Shaw's speculation. I can't wait to read it. I want to read about this little girl with these glasses in the future. It's on my to be read list <laughs> and it's, and I can't get to it quick enough, but I want to see when I read these books by my peers, I'm constantly thinking, oh, how could I teach this? How could I teach this? What could I dig back in from history, you know, and, and, and pull it forward and, and, and put it into some curriculum? Because the fun thing that I love about, um, even with my novel about the magical food factory, I did some digging and here I'm finding that a black woman, I think in, in, in New Orleans, uh, actually invented the pastry fork, which eventually became the spatula. And then I the find that black a woman. black man actually invented the ice cream scoop. And so I'm throwing all this inside of my of my uh, of my novel, you know, that takes place in the present. So I think that we have to create ancillary materials or work with other educators to create ancillary materials so that it stays with us and then we can pass it down and teach it to our children. And I think that would be one of the ways to, um, to ensure that it stays and sticks with us. Thank you so much. So speaking of sticking power, we would like to finally hear from each one of you in the order that you read, how can we stay connected? Um, whether it's social media, website, where can we find your books? And please do tell us about your Hurston Wright uh, workshop. Okay, let me make sure I can remember all that. How to stay in touch. Um, my website is um, the same as my name. So uh, NinaAngelaMercer.com. You can find me there. Um, you can also find me on Instagram and Facebook the same way, Nina Angela Mercer. Keep it really simple for folks. Um, you can also keep an eye out because we have a development lab happening for Play of Mind Gypsy and the Bully Door. Um, at the Racial Justice Institute, the Woodshed Center for Art, Thought, and Culture at the Racial Justice Institute, which is where I'm a community engagement fellow at Georgetown. And that will be um, October 8th. So we hope that folk will come out for that. And if you follow me on my website or on Instagram or Facebook, we'll have, um, we'll have updates about that as it comes along and comes through. You can find um, all of the titles where I'm published uh, on my website. All of that information is there. Um, the other question was about my workshop. Is that? Yes. Okay. Um, so the playwriting workshop starts on, um, it starts on Monday and we have five days together um, where we'll be working together in lab and workshop and playing because when you when you work in theater, when you're a dramatist, we get we we, we get our bodies involved. We, you know, like we really put our whole selves into the work physically. There's often some physicality. So what we'll be doing is um we'll be workshopping around how to make plays. And there are many different ways you can make plays and many different styles of play that you can write. So we'll try to get a little sampling in there. We'll be doing some reading together of a few different types of plays, reading aloud because orality is really important for theater folk. You need to know how your scenes, how your plays sound. Um, and we'll be, of course, writing together and I'll be giving um, intense feedback. And my hope is that the workshop participants will leave with a draft, another, another layer of a draft of a work that they want to focus on. Um, and I'm really excited about it. I'm also 
a couple of us are going to see a play um, this weekend as well. I got some tickets from the Woolly Mammoth to go see something exciting. So that that's that's what it's going to look like, and I'm I'm really excited to to be in the room with folk. Thank you, B. Charisse. Um, I'm kind of on like a Facebook break right now. <laughs> and I said I would do that for at least 90 days. Um, and it's been peaceful because I've just been having challenges. Um, but my Twitter is still open. My um, IG is still open. And I, and I put that in the chat. Uh, Twitter is um, Charisse underscore B. And uh, my IG is B dot Charisse. Um, next week, I will be doing a, uh, I'm part of the Read Black Books Conference. So as the writer in residence at Hurston Wright, over the past several months, I've been compiling a database of um, picture books, young adult novels, and middle grade novels by black authors. And so what we will be doing next week is I will be showing educators and um, as well as um, homeschoolers, how to create extension activities based on the books that are in the database or any book. And so uh, what I'm doing is I'm incorporating Bloom's Taxonomy, of course, because that's just <laughs> the foundation. But I also really have a deep um, love for Gardner's Multiple Intelligences. So we will be designing all kinds of things. We'll be doing dioramas. We'll be talking about biokinesthetic activities and naturalist activities, and um, as well as visual activities. I have been a great documentarian. I have to pat myself on the back over the past 13 years of teaching where I took pictures of all the, the uh, video games my students designed, the board games they designed. Um, my students, even some of them baked a cake based on the setting of a novel. So I had a student that did that one year. Um, some of them have um, created pop-up books and I have these amazing shoes that students have designed based on characterization. So it's been amazing. And I'll be talking with um, educators and homeschoolers about how to do that. So next week, uh, Read Black Books Conference, it's Monday through Thursday, it'll be virtual. And then Friday, we will be in person at Sankofa Books. Um, and Cafe on George Avenue in Washington, D.C. Sexy. And finally, Nisi Shaw. Hey, what was the question? <laughs> you. It's just you. We want we want to stay connected to you. So how, how can okay. we stay connected? Website, social media, where can we find your books? And um, if you could tell us about your workshop. Okay. Um, so I, I put the... Uh, website and uh, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook on there. So I knew there was something missing from Facebook. You haven't been there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, my workshop is called Word Building for World Building. And that starts Monday. And, you know, it'll be about neologisms and, you know, similes and aphorisms and all that kind of stuff that goes with making your world out of words. Um, I also teach quite a bit with, uh, writing the other, um, we have a writing the .com website and there's like a couple of classes coming up there with like me and Aliyah Don Johnson teaching and stuff. Um, mm, yeah. Um, I don't know. Google me. <laughs> I'm a big deal. No, just kidding. <laughs> yes. Yes. So um, I also put my, um, please do stay in contact with me, Olu Butterfly, Instagram. And um, we want to close out with some words from Hurst, the Hurston Wright Foundation. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'd like to close with just saying thank you, everyone, for attending and um, getting connected, having a community, listening to um, speculative fiction and world building and getting to know our instructors um, and um, and really just having um, this moment together. Thank you for joining us virtually. Um, we will continue to have, like I said, our writing, um, our summer of writing. Um, if you take a, take a look at us at Eventbrite, um, we have a variety of different um, events that's happening. Um, 
B. Sharice Moore's um, Read Black Books is happening next week that um, people are still able to sign up for. We have our workshops that's happening at Howard University. Unfortunately, they're closed, but please keep in touch with us so you can find out when we have our next um, writer's workshop. Um, and you can find all of that out at hurstonwright.org. And please check us out again and log on when we have our next event. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you.